Good morning, it's March 24th, 2018, and I want to begin by um, continuing in the argument that Richard Taylor laid against Weinkoop, uh, and in order to do that, you can't just look at his pamphlet, you know, Why the Holiness Movement Died, where he summarizes his argument and gives you his main point. Um, instead, you got to look into this third volume of Exploring Christian Holiness. Uh, it's called The Theological Formulation. Um, and in it, he makes a very clear argument right from the word go that that is his intention is to come against uh, relational theology. Um, for instance, when he gets into his position, he immediately argues um, that under his concept of the freedom of God's action, that when God created this world, um, he did not make it by his hands, so to speak, uh, not just showing his ingenuity, instead it spoke, he spoke it into existence, which means that in order to get a biblical balanced picture of who God is, you have to understand that he is other, um, O-T-H-E-R, from his created world. Okay, and if you really understand Weinkoop's position, uh, she is coming from Alfred North Whitehead and an argument that immediately Richard Taylor brings up. Uh, he says that God is not part of this created order. And so he says he's not, uh, the true orthodox position is not pantheism. If you ever heard that term, it means God is all. So everything is God in the universe. Um, and then he he adds in panentheism. Now, panentheism is an argument against Weinkoop or uh, against Whitehead, which is that God is in all. They added the Greek word in, n, into the word pantheism, and it means that God is in all. And obviously, it's an overfocus on God's imminence or his nearness, um, which is one aspect of God in Scripture. But you cannot overfocus on that to the exclusion of his otherness, which is what they're doing. Um, so they're obviously messing up the very beginning of Scripture. And he points that out. He says it's very vitally important that you see that God spoke into the existence of this world instead of um, as though he, it had emanated from him. Okay, and uh, so that's one of his arguments that he makes immediately. And moving from that, uh, let's see if I can get my next one up. All right, then he uh, argues that God is the judge of this world. And obviously, um, with Weinkoop's overemphasis on love, you know, that idea um, falls to the wayside. We're going to see how, when it comes to the doctrine of sin and man's separateness from God. But he argues that God is still sending judgment in such form as in Haggai 1, 9 to 11, Malachi 3, 9 to 12 today. But people are, today are too dulled by their scientism to perceive what is happening. Uh, the increased disturbances in the natural order of recent years is not blind chance. God's trying to speak to modern man. It's coming from Matthew 24, 7 to 8 and Revelation 6, 12 to 16. You know, he's arguing that's why God is allowing the world to come more and more under um, catastrophe. Um, you know, because as an Orthodox Christian, he believes that the world is being judged by God to this day. Uh, matter of fact, that's one of the most recent arguments that I've debated online uh, with another pastor who is in Wesleyan circles, he was arguing that, uh, you know, Kirk Cameron was wrong to have stated that God would bring judgment on this world. And uh, I don't know what Bible he's reading because it's from start to finish. It's everywhere in the scripture. And that's what he argues next. He says, basically, you're throwing out um, the whole Bible when you say that because the Bible shows that famine and drought and ex and that was my first argument I made towards him was that you can hardly find um, a drought famine uh, serious thing that happened in the Old Testament or in the in the New Testament without a reference in the first place to God's hand in it um, and so he he uses his judgment to call man's attention to repentance but obviously he also uses it to rebuke them for the rejection and their resistance to his his will. And so um, these, I, these aspects are all forfeited in order to get to this theology um, of love, so-called, you know, because it's only one aspect of his nature, not both aspects, which equal his holiness, which is what I've argued in my third volume. All right, um, now, then he moves on to the doctrine of holiness in man. And he takes another uh, shot at Weinkoop. He says, man cannot properly speak of having a quote-unquote spark of divinity in him pantheist or theosophical in any um, pantheistic or theosophical sense. So, you know, we are not emanations off of God. This is ancient pagan 
thought and uh, at the basic root of, of Weinkoop's theology is that idea that we are relationally uh, connected to God, all right, and uh, still, even after the fall, that there's no separateness from God, okay, uh, and so he goes on, he's not a fragment of God, and he can never achieve such a mystical union with God that the holy otherness, which is what we just talked about of God, on the one hand, and the unique distinctiveness of man on the other are blurred. You know, there has to be uh, a separateness between me and God. You know, I'm my own um, uh, personhood, and God is his personhood. I'm my own, I'm his creation, he is the creator. You know, obviously we can't blur those lines, and it's completely, these are all orthodox concepts that are basic to theology, basic in the scripture, and forfeited in Weinkoop's theology, um, because it's a, a philosophical um, place she's coming from. It's not the destiny of man to become gods as the Mormons teach. Okay, so obviously he's taking stabs at her thinking, and uh, it keeps doing, he does this all throughout his whole entire work. It's intended. And um, all right, so the next one is important because he talks about uh, the the orthodox distinction between likeness and image. And today, you know, I was reading through some of our more modern material, even 10, 15 years ago, and they started changing that. They started saying, oh, you know, we're, there's no distinction between the image of God versus the likeness of God, okay? And they're saying one, uh, and it's one and the same, so they say it's a Hebraism. Every time that's spoken of in Scripture, it's just repeated for the sake of, uh, and it's shown to be by that, that it's the same thing being repeated twice. Well, um, there's a fundamental flaw to that because you're not reading the context of the Scripture, okay? And so if you go into, I think it's Genesis chapter 6, uh, something like that, it argues that, uh, Adam, after the fall, had a son in his own likeness. And again, it repeats it. It says, in his own image. And so, um, interesting, it's likeness first. And I think that's intended because the quality or the state, which, you know, relationists hate so much, is emphasized first. You know, we were born, uh, uh, we were made, I'm sorry, in the image of God. And upright, uh, rightness was natural to Adam and Eve. And uh, it was the state of being. But, it all, you know, the state of their whole condition of their being, okay? And that's more fundamental than ethical action, okay? So you have to have a heart condition out of which your life um, fruits. And that's what Jesus taught. Jesus said, by your, their fruit, you'll know them. He didn't say, uh, you know, that looking at, uh, you know, their fruit is them, okay? And that's what process philosophers believe. They believe that the ongoing and the outcome of each person uh, as they're responding to others is is their actual um, being. So being is becoming, okay? And obviously that's false. And so Jesus said, no, being is more fundamental. And the state of being is, is the character of, is who they are, okay? And that's what determines their fruit. That's what determines their outcome. So, um, and so, but at the bottom line of that, you know, we are not uh, made holy, okay, now. And so that's the confusion that I think Dunning, who's Wayne Coop's fruit, is uh, bringing to everything when he calls man essentially good. He, he acts like today man is essentially good. Because we were originally made up, right, therefore we are essentially good is a false uh, concept. There's a skip of logic there. You're basically saying that uh, you don't have to be holy uh, now that God's already kept us holy all along. That's that's underlying that. It's confusing to people, okay? Um, because more fundamental to man's holiness, uh, as originally created, was the fact that it's immiscible, and man can change. You know, man's nature can change. God's, um, you know, holiness is forever, and it's uh, essential. It's essential to his being. But to us, uh, obviously, we can still exist, and that's what he goes on to argue. He says the moral image and, he's, and this is what he states under it. Everything said so far about man's nature belongs to what is called the natural image of God in man, which would be um, the fact that man is uh, intelligent, uh, that this is the characteristics of personhood. He's, um, uh, he's self-aware, you know, so we are conscious. And, uh, you know, it's interesting today how evolutionists who are panentheists um, are trying to figure out how um, consciousness just evolved, you know, see, because they think that it's part of this natural world. And uh, you have to understand that we are one of God's created um, 
finished results and uh the create and then the earth is you know we're not uh emanations of this earth either do you see what i'm saying we're separate from the uh created order that way of of the earth and the universe you know man is not part of the universe see we are made as um finished results of god's creation okay and uh separate entities and that's the whole point um but he says that the natural image is, is self-awareness, it's your free will, uh, it's moral freedom, it's, uh, you know, to choose, uh, and on and on it goes. These are things that uh, make us, you know, f uh, emotion, uh, you know, these are the, the natural image. And after the fall, those, those aspects were all retained, okay? So um, in that sense, the natural image that God created us with so that we're above uh, beasts of the earth and we have that in common obviously all those aspects are are retained after the fall they're still here there's you know they're not completely lost they're all affected that's why i believe the hebraism that they argue happens where he says the image he was at um adam had son in his own uh likeness and in his image the reason being is because the image itself is affected uh you know the natural image is affected by the loss of the likeness okay and so that's what he goes on to talk about. And he says the moral image would be, uh, you know, the likeness. And obviously the likeness, if Adam and Eve were made in the likeness of God originally, they were made upright. They, rightness was natural to them. But after um, Adam sinned, you know, the scripture is very clear that he had a son in his own likeness, okay, which means fallen nature and uh, sinfulness, okay, and sinwardness, and, and, you know, instead of a relationship to God, this is the separating factor, okay? And so he says, as has already been said, this is the gos the ground of communication, um, is the natural image. But two persons may communicate without either enjoyment or fellowship. If there is to be spiritual unity, see, there is no relationship to God. Here's where he's attacking one group directly. There must also be, in addition to the likeness of personhood, a fundamental character likeness, which is called the moral image. That's orthodox term for it. Since God is holy in moral, moral character as well as in other um, ways unique to deity, man also must be holy. This is called the moral image of God in man. Uh, and so, you know, that's what was lost. That's what he's trying to teach you. And this is true biblical doctrine. And uh, to say that we're still in relationship to God and not clarify this any longer is to say that we're in moral image of God, which is obviously false. There's so many ways you can get to making man sound like he is naturally good, which is Plagianism, and that's where he eventually goes. He does eventually call uh, Weinkoop's teaching the new form of Plagianism, where you uh, have process theology go over to Whitehead, uh, and relational theology, I mean, go over to Whitehead's process theology, and then you start thinking that man is naturally good, okay? And obviously that's wrong. All right, so here's his fi final blow in these early chapters. He says, uh, sound condition must underline and be prior to sound moral action. There it is. You can hear him attacking directly at Weinkoop's heart of her problem now. Um, he's basically saying that deeper down than choice is moral characters the state of moral character and so you need to have that cleansed okay obviously such was wesley's insistence in his debate with the unitarian john taylor who was a unorthodox man in john wesley's day taylor because he had no concept of either holiness or sinfulness but the fully ethical so just like wine coop he's taking a full blown stab at her here uh john taylor believed that uh all there was was right action like charles finney okay and obviously you have to understand there's a state of sinfulness that's separating us from god uh from birth okay and that it's deeper down than ethical character ethical choice um and so but fully ethical he denied both inbred sin and original holiness he insisted that righteousness is right action that was his full picture of it you know um so again he's a process theologian okay uh, before, <laughs> long before Whitehead, all right? To such, Wesley replied, indeed, it is not. See, Wesley cannot be associated with this way of thinking. Here is your fundamental mistake, as was Weinkoop's. It's a right state of mind, which differs from right action as the cause does from the effect. Righteousness, which is the state that you that you need to have at the, at the foundation of who you are, you need to be sanctified so you can have that. Righteousness is properly and directly a right temper or disposition of mind or a complex of all right tempers. 
And so I, he says, obviously, a concept of sin or holiness that is exclusively um, volitional cannot claim Wesley for support. And you know it from the uh, article I read to you that that's exactly what he said about wine coop. And so you can clearly hear his argument he's making here. And it's very, very strong against the um, underlying teachings that are basic to her theology. Thank you.